All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, tonight's all candidates debate on the environment. Uh, my name is uh, Rob Barnes. I'm the executive director of Ecology Ottawa. And tonight we are co-hosting this event with uh, MD Moms uh, for a Healthy Recovery, which is a great uh, local group that looks at the intersection of environment and health. Uh, we're really uh, happy to be joined tonight uh, by four of the candidates running in uh, the riding of Canada Carleton. Uh, so I just have a few words to say at the front end, uh, and then I'm going to uh, share the stage with, uh, with Sarah Sloan from MD Moms to say a few words. So uh, again, thank you for joining us tonight, taking time out of your evening. I know uh, elections are busy times for everyone, and I really appreciate you uh, and the candidates uh, spending some time with us this evening. Uh, as you heard at the front end, this event is being recorded as well. We're streaming live on Facebook. Uh, we're Almost all of us are in Ottawa. So we are, uh, take, this event is taking place on uh, unceded Algonquin territory. We'd like to acknowledge that. And this debate is actually part of a nationwide series of debates and discussions on the environment uh, being uh, organized by Green Pack, which is a national level organization. Uh, the, the, the nationwide event is called 100 Debates for the Environment. Uh, obviously, the environment matters a lot. Uh, as, uh, you know, as, as the executive director of Ecology Ottawa, I can speak to the importance of the local connections on environment, everything from the vibrancy of our green space to the design of our neighborhoods to uh, sustainable and active trans uh, transportation to the importance of, of climate change, green jobs, and the clean energy transition. So we'll touch on all of those aspects tonight. Uh, from Ecology Ottawa's vantage point, we're going to try to anchor a lot of these big, heady national issues to a local focus. Uh, and I'm sure MD Moms uh, for Healthy Recovery will also do a fantastic job with their questions that touch on that intersection of health and environment. And with that, I'll uh, now share the stage with Sarah Sloan uh, mm -hmm. from that group to say a few words. Thanks very much, Rob. I appreciate that. Yes, and thank you to all of our candidates for being here today. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity and we're very glad to have this, uh, this opportunity to speak with, with each of you. Uh, so as mentioned, I, my name is Sarah Sloan. I'm a family physician here in Ottawa and I am a member of MD Mums for Healthy Recovery. We're actually a national group, though we do have quite an Ottawa uh, presence, um, but a national group of mums um, who are also physicians. And each of us is dedicated to advocating for strong climate action that will protect the health of every Canadian today and every child um, across the planet um, who, who is yet to be born in our future generations, of course. You know, we've known um, for years now, the World Health Organization has been very clear that climate change is the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century. And the UN's report recently has been unequivocal that it is now code red for humanity. So we, as physicians, we, we recognize that this is emergency um, territory that we are now in, and we agree with the declaration of climate emergencies. And we are now um, seeking and strongly advocating for a response that meets, uh, that, that fits the urgency and the emergency that we, that we are facing. Recently, we've seen 230 academic journals around the world unite in calling for this emergency action. This is, you know, unprecedented, and they are each calling for world leaders to keep warming to 1.5 degrees, to protect nature and to restore biodiversity as we understand that these factors are critical for protecting the health uh, and providing a livable future for everyone on this planet, uh, as mentioned, including children born today and our future generations. As physicians, we recognize that health depends on a stable climate and emergency level action is needed now to ensure a healthy, livable planet. And, and on that note, um, I'll turn it back to Rob and we look forward to uh, engaging in a, a very um, enlightening debate tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So I just have a little bit of housekeeping at the front end, just so everyone knows what's happening, including the candidates, uh, which is always important. So today's event will go a little over an hour. We're going to try to wrap up by about 7.15. Um, so there will be a section for introductions then a series of prepared questions uh, from both MD Moms and Ecology Ottawa. We invite the audience to submit questions as well. There's a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, so please use that. And Eric will be uh, sending, uh, we'll probably have a space for about three questions from the audience. Uh, we're going to try to move towards closing statements at around 7 p.m. 
Euh, S'il y a des questions en français, euh, je poserai des questions en français et en anglais, et les candidats vont choisir de répondre dans la langue de, de leur choix. So if there are questions that folks have in French, please send them over. Uh, we're going to translate them, and we will provide them to the candidates in both languages, and then they can respond in the language of their choice. Uh, a technical note, all candidates were invited uh, this evening. Uh, we did not receive a response from Jennifer McAndrew. Uh, but we are joined uh, by Melissa Cohenrad from the NDP, Jenna Suds from the Liberal Party, Scott Miller from the People's Party, and Jennifer Purdy from the Green Party. Uh, the candidates have been randomized to a certain extent. So for each of these questions, there's going to be a bit of a different order, but everyone should have a chance to speak first, speak second, speak third, and speak fourth. Uh, so it's as fair as possible. Uh, 10 seconds before the end of the question, uh, Eric will chime in to say something like 10 seconds, and then after that point, uh, apologies in advance, we're gonna have to mute people and move on to the next uh, response uh, just to keep things tight, focused. And so again, uh, you know, trying to be respectful of everyone's time, very much appreciating your contribution, but we will have to cut you off if uh, we're running uh, short on time. So without any further ado, let's move on to introductions. So each candidate has one minute to provide uh, an, introduction, an introductory statement. And we'll begin uh, with Jennifer Purdy. Okay, so uh, good evening et bonjour à tous. I am Jen Purdy. I'm representing the Green Party. I am a medical doctor, a 23-year veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces, a small business owner, and a farmer. And as a leader, I have led people in the military, and I've also led medical teams. As an individual, I've taken steps to decrease my carbon footprint. We install geothermal heating and solar panels. I drive a used Leaf or other cars in old Prius, but full disclosure, we also have an F-250 Ford because I live on a farm. I eat a whole foods plant-based diet, which also decreases my footprint. I have an electric bicycle. I air dry my clothing year round and I even use bar soap to wash my hair. We have an opportunity to make a choice and for us to truly prioritize addressing climate change and taking better care of one another. We can see the effects climate change is having here in Ottawa and in Canada Carleton, especially this summer. Air quality readings in Canada Carleton have been even worse than in downtown Ottawa. I have seen a few patients this summer, including a child whose asthma had worsened and the only change in their environment was the air quality due to Ontario forest fires. We must take action now. Great, thank you very much, uh, Jen. Uh, up next is Melissa Conrad from the NDP. Thank you. So um, yeah, my name is Melissa Conrad and I'm a healthcare worker and a mom and an average Canadian, just like all of you. And I'm, I've seen a lot of the cracks in the system uh, working through this pandemic in healthcare and a lot of the effects, um, mental health effects and otherwise. Um, and I'm really excited that the NDP really has prepared bold targets for climate um, that with immediate action, because that's what we need. We need to keep global warming to 1.5% and our extreme weather events are becoming more and more frequent and more and more close to home. Canada Carleton has had more than their fair share of catastrophic uh, extreme weather events um, in the last couple of years. So the NDP's goals are attainable, bold, and will get us back on track by 2030 seconds. and 2050. And so I'm really excited about Jagmeet's passion and the NDP will fight climate change like we want to win climate change because that's what it's going to take. Thank you, Melissa. Um, up next is Jenna Suds from the Liberal Party. Excellent. Good evening, Bonsoir. My name's Jenna Suds. I'm a mother, an economist, a city councillor, your deputy mayor, and a self-proclaimed EV enthusiast. I'm committed to a cleaner, greener future. Uh, climate change, as we all know, is real. And Canadians want real action to fight it. The Liberal government has put in place Canada's first ever climate plan, a plan that's grown more ambitious every year. Together, we've assembled the building blocks for a safe, healthy, and prosperous net zero emissions future. We cannot let the Conservatives roll, roll black climate change. We need to move forward with an even more ambitious plan to tackle climate change, one that seizes the opportunities of a green economy and positions Canada for long-term growth. I am running to serve you in this capacity and one in which I continue to defend your interests and advocate for, advocate for a cleaner, greener future. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Up next is Scott Miller from the PPC. 
Hi, my name is Scott Miller. I'm a software engineer of uh, three decades or so, uh, worked in the Ottawa area. I'm a huge fan of the planet. This is my very favorite planet. Uh, it's the only one I'll likely ever be on. I have, a, I have a daughter who wants to be an astronaut, but even then, this is likely the only planet they'll ever be on. So I'm very interested in the health of the planet. What I'm not interested in is, is uh, empty gestures. Uh, and most of what the other parties, most of what you see in the news proposing to fix the climate is empty gestures. Even if you accept, which I don't particularly accept that CO2 is a, is a, is a strong greenhouse gas, Canada generates less than 2% of it. All the gestures we want to make, all anything you want to do, anything we'll ever hear about tonight is going to have zero impact in the world. And to think that with our moral suasion, China will jump up and... Oh, China will will decide to emulate us in our act in is uh, is hubris of the greatest in, of to the greatest extent. So empty gestures are not what anyone needs. Thank you, Scott. Okay, now we're moving on to our first uh, of a series of prepared questions. These questions were prepared by MD Moms for a Healthy Recovery, as well as Ecology Ottawa. And uh, for each question, what I'm going to do is I'll say the question, but I'll also post it in the chat so you can have a look at it. Uh, 1.5 minutes each to answer these questions. So the first question is from MD Moms and looks at the intersection of health and environment. This week, more than 200 medical journals, including leading journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet, released an unprecedented joint statement warning that climate change is the greatest threat to global public health and that world leaders need to heat, cut heat trapping emissions to avoid catastrophic and irreversible harm to health. COVID-19 has highlighted the risk of overloading our healthcare system. And we know that the health system relies on a healthy environment. The research shows that the health effects of climate change are going to get exponentially worse unless we act quickly to significantly cut greenhouse gas emissions and strengthen environmental protections. So if elected, how will you ensure that our health will be protected in the coming years? That's our first question. And the first uh, respondent is Scott Miller from the People's Party. I will now post in the chat. Just rereading that, but the question is, how, how will you ensure that our health will be protected in the coming years? Well, it's not by banning fossil fuels, that's for sure. Because the again, the, the contribution Canada makes to uh, CO2 or pollution in general in the world is, is minuscule. The whole emphasis on CO2 is completely wrongheaded. It's very popular though. What we can do to improve health, there are very practical things. Getting rid of coal plants in Ontario made a big difference, a big improvement in air quality in Ontario. We used to have a lot of smog days, we don't now. By replacing coal with natural gas and nuclear power, that makes that big difference. It's not, we're still using fossil fuels. Well, I think we, we didn't create any, uh, any new nuclear plants, which we should be doing, but by just, just by going to natural gas from coal made a significant, a real difference in air quality in some of the big cities. These are the types of, of, of efforts we need to make. Again, practical, realistic, cost-effective efforts, not just waving flags and, and demonstrating. Um, Trying to think it's a long question was it overloading the healthcare system health is uh, so that's that's that would be so accepting co2 as a pollutant i think is wrong-headed there is lots of other real pollutants we need to deal with uh so again uh so the carbon we we've had 10 seconds diesel particulates are a problem car emissions we've already made efforts to to uh overcome that stuff but co2 is not the enemy thank you scott up next is jenna sutz Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to approach this uh, question in two ways. So the first is just to uh, state that uh, the Liberal Party will deliver on our climate commitments. So we have invested over 100 billion to fight climate change and build a clean economy here in Canada. And that includes uh, 53.6 billion for green recovery. But for these investments to deliver, Canadians need a government with a real plan to meet these climate goals. And the second piece that I'd like to add is the importance of nature. Um, I think throughout this pandemic, we have all come to value our green spaces and protecting nature more than ever, as nature is central to our lives, our communities, and our health. And a re-elected Liberal government is building on that by establishing 10 new national parks, 
and 10 new national marine conservation areas in the next five years, uh, doubling the size of the existing national parks that we can all get out and enjoy as Canadians. Uh, th this is one example of others, of many, of steps that we are taking that I believe are very impactful in our overall health individually. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenna. Up next is Melissa Conrad from the NDP. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited that the NDP is going to create a Canadian Environmental Bill of Rights. This will allow us to ensure the future of green economy going forward on top of electric um, vehicles, lessening our GHGs. We're also going to improve upon Bill C-28 to ensure that Canadians are protected from toxins in substances that they purchase and consume. We're going to strengthen that so that we don't have those long-term effects of exposure. We're also excited to implement a national freshwater strategy to be cleaning up our fresh water and our oceans for us here in Canada Carleton and in this area is mainly fresh water so that you have that opportunity to take your kids out, swim in a lake, go to the beach, be outside, because as we all know, that helps our mental health, that helps our families have outdoor time when they don't have backyards and live in urban areas. We also need to make sure that our farmers and our local, our food as much as we can is grown local and that they have the ability to get us fresh foods consistently and with the best technology um, so that we can purchase local and have, and have organic safe options here in Canada that stay in Canada, and that will also help us to stay healthy. Thanks very much, Melissa. Up next is Jennifer Purdy from the Green Party. Okay, so um, first off, I think uh, it's important to note that, uh, and most people here probably listening in may be aware, the Liberals have not delivered. There were two very basic uh, things that could have been done. One basic promise in 2015, canceling the oil and gas subsidies, it still has not been done and it would take, oh, a stroke of a pen. So it's not that difficult. So clearly there's no serious intent. If you go to their platform, it says that they see climate change as being a long-term plan. People in Ottawa have had tornadoes, floods, uh, you know, extreme weather and the droughts and the heat uh, for the last couple of years now, right? Uh, so this is not a long-term, we cannot have a long-term vision. That is what has led us to where we are and we're, we're just we're leading down the road to devastation. In terms of what the Greens will do, indirectly from climate change, but still important. The housing, pharmacare, uh, adapt adapt adaptation and mitigation strategies for climate change, guaranteed livable income, basic dental for low income Canadians, and also endorsing a whole food plant-based diet and moving away from uh, uh, large uh, animal livestock, livestock operations, which is a key contributor to uh, climate change. But also obviously we have a very aggressive, the most aggressive plan uh, for climate change. And uh, the, the two big things that would be easiest to do, cancel the TMX pipeline, which is projected to take us to three to four degrees of warming. 10 uh, seconds. Would be right. Uh, and also canceling those oil and gas subsidies. And then from there on, basically, updating the electrical grid, uh, grid or providing funding for that and, uh, you know, retrograding or uh, retrofitting, sorry, retrofitting uh, all the, ho the housing and uh, large buildings across the country, starting with the federal government. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, we're moving on to another uh, type of question. This one's focused on trees, water and green space in the Ottawa area uh, and in Canada. So here's the question. Canada is a signatory to the Global Convention on Biological Diversity, which seeks to address global biodiversity loss. Cities are particularly important for nature protection due to high levels of human impact on ecosystems. Ottawa in particular requires strong federal leadership due to cross-jurisdictional ecosystems, this is like the Ottawa River watershed, for example, and large tracts of land managed by the National Capital Commission, which of course is ultimately managed by the federal government. So as MP, what are your plans to protect nature in Ottawa? Uh, that's the question. And we'll start with uh, Melissa for this one. Thank you. Yeah, so protecting, um, so protecting nature in Ottawa is really important to us. I think that um, we saw that in Canada 
uh, quite a bit with the sprawling that's happening. And the NDP is really, really focused on making sure that our forest areas are replenished. We need to plant more forests. We need to stop cutting them down, um, especially our old growth forests, which we don't have a lot of them here, but we do have some that are nice and healthy. And we want to keep them that way, not sell them off to builders um, and make sure that we improve the trails in this area so that we can use them because we have the opportunity in Canada specifically to have so many trails and so many areas and parks parks that we can go to, um, not far as Gatineau Park. And we need to make sure that we protect them because uh, it's easy for uh, governments to say, okay, we'll sell off a little bit of this. And we've seen that encroachment on the current um, green belts in Ottawa, where there's been permissions to build on them by the current government, um, which is really not acceptable since our, our um, city is sprawling out so much that we need to protect those lands. And so that's a real big focus okay. for the NDP here and all over Canada, as well as cleaning up our fresh water because it's very dirty um, and we need to work on that and it's going to take time. But the more we can work on that, the more we'll have it available. For all right, thank you, Melissa. And, uh, and again, apologies in advance in case we have to mute people. We we have a 10 second limit there, um, but thank you very much for that answer. Up next is, uh, we're going to hand this over to Jennifer next. Please go ahead. So the, the one issue for Ottawa, yes, you have the, nat, the like uh, the NCC area, but a lot of Ottawa, of course, uh, we may or may not, we, we don't have the jurisdiction, right? So what, what we have to do is we have to have a government in place, a federal government that's cooperative with a, with a provincial government, even when they wear different colors as in with liberal versus conservative, you have to have those cooperative relationships. And you also have the cooperative relationship with the munis uh, municipal government, in this case, uh, the city of Ottawa. Uh, because the other thing too, is that uh, right now, now, obviously, the city is is taking prime agri or prime agricultural uh, land and designate it's in, it's being developed, and we're seeing this in Dunrobin and in the Carleton part of Canada, Carleton, and it's it's really unacceptable and it's a tragedy, and it's hard to really speak about how much uh, we are concerned about the environment when we're not doing anything to protect it. So, what would the green government uh, do? Is it's like is would basically be to be working with the other levels of government in order to pr protect the, the woodlands and to avoid further uh, development where possible. The other thing too is where development needs to occur, it should be smarter development. It should not be single family homes. We have a big issue with affordable housing. So should we, we should be looking at more uh, at affordable housing, uh, multifamily uh, you know, dwellings and, and that sort of thing as well. Uh, we also, our intention is to protect 30% uh, of fresh waters. And so that would also involve the city Thanks. of well, thank you. We've got the Ottawa River. Uh, and also a big issue that isn't being talked about enough is plastics. Uh, we had a very minimal plastics ban uh, for straws of all things uh, from the Liberal government, but clearly that. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Scott, you're up next. Uh, again, I think you'd have to say we'd focus on practical uh, short-term measures. Water quality is an important one. The The Ottawa River, my understanding is there's still communities upriver that are dumping sewage in the water. Never mind downriver, but that's not our direct concern, but it's a, it's a huge problem as a city like Montreal or Quebec is dumping raw sewage, which the current government has done nothing about. Uh, and it, but again, uh, there was our, I understand communities upriver are doing that as well. Protecting existing green space is critical. It is a case where builders tend to get what they want in cities, particularly at the municipal level. There was a famous case here in Ottawa a number of years ago. There was a protected wetland. The one day somebody realized that somebody had come in and cut down all the trees. Oops. And they got away with it. They just traded a piece of less desirable uh, land for that, and they're building houses on it now. Uh, that is completely unacceptable. When people do things like that, you know, they, they need to be stopped and they need to be with effective action, you'd make sure that doesn't happen again. And again, that was a failure at the local level primarily. But so at the federal level, what can you do? We don't have, protecting the urban environment is a very different thing than protecting wildlife. So trees are, are critical in the urban environment, but you can't think that is really, it's a very localized effect. The more trees you have, seconds. the less concrete you have, the less uh, heat effect you're going to get. So definitely trees in a city, but cities still represent a very tiny proportion of the land in, in Canada. They're important when you live in them and, and most we all. 
Thanks very much, Scott. Okay, up next is Jenna. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so when it comes to Canada Carleton, I think we're incredibly fortunate that we do have some amazing green spaces um, and waterfronts. Uh, thinking of the beaches, obviously in Constance Bay and Fitzroy, the Fitzroy Provincial Park where my family spends a lot of time. Uh, we have a lot of really great green space. And then when I think about Canada proper, you know, as city councillor for Canada North, I've been very active in protecting our green space uh, and successfully. Um, our Canada golf course is a great example where developers uh, wanted to proceed with development. And I have successfully uh, been able to fight that off both at council and in court so far, it is an appeal. Uh, but also thinking about the urban boundary expansion. And there was a proposal for further urban boundary expansion for development up March Road, uh, heading out towards uh, towards into as far as Dunrobin and out Old Second Line. And I was able to get uh, to get that off the table. So I think I have a track record of protecting our green space. Uh, I think at the federal level, it does take collaboration. It takes collaboration with all three levels of government and I'm ready to get to work. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. So up next, we're going to move to the category of sustainable transportation. And we'll talk a little bit about the city for a second. Uh, the city of Ottawa's climate plan, Energy Evolution, outlines a pathway to net zero community level emissions by 2050. A key part of this plan involves the widespread and rapid adoption of electric vehicles by private citizens. Canada has stated that it will ban the sale of fuel burning new cars and light duty trucks by 2035. However, it's one thing to have a target, it's another thing to get to it. So it's widely acknowledged that additional steps will be needed to meet this target, possibly including policies aimed at incentives, education, supply and infrastructure around electric vehicles. So as MP, what are your plans to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles in Ottawa? And to get started, we're going to go right back to Jenna Sutz. Oh, Sorry, okay. just rereading the question here. Okay, terrific. I'm happy to lead on this. So I'm an EV owner. I've had my uh, electric car now for two years and I'm very passionate about the opportunity here. Uh, we're also very fortunate actually in Canada Carleton to have more EV chargers in this part of the city than anywhere else uh, in the city. We have over 35 just in our technology park alone, uh, almost every building. Um, as MP, I would like to see more charging infrastructure, obviously rolled out across the country, but also here in Canada Carleton to de-risk, to take away the fear for people uh, when it comes to purchasing and owning an electric vehicle. Uh, we know as well that the Liberal government has uh, invested deeply uh, in EV technologies and has offered a up to $5,000 rebate for uh, those that choose to purchase an EV as a way to help, uh, you know, help influence those decisions. I think it's incredibly important that we all think about this as an opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, I'm leading by example, but I would love to have the opportunity to help influence policy in this space as well to make seconds. sure that we take the necessary steps. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenna. Now over to Scott Miller. I don't think that subsidizing EVs is the way to go. I don't think, uh, I believe if EV adoption is to come, it needs to become organically. It needs to make economic sense for people to do it. If they want to buy a Tesla, they don't need us to subsidize them 10 or $15,000, whatever is the program last year. I actually, in 2019, I went shopping for a new car. I went and I tried out the Nissan Leaf. It was, it was a good little car, but it was $15,000 more than, even after the rebate, it was $15,000 more than the made in Ontario Honda Civic I ended up choosing. And the Civic has a much greater range. Now I'd still like to get one, it's kind of cool, but it worked just fine, but it's not worth an additional $15,000. And I wouldn't expect anybody else to give me $15,000 to make up the difference. So they will come as the technology improves. Batteries technology is, is still, we had electric cars 100 years ago, and the batteries were the weak link, and they're still the weak link. 
They're a lot better, but we're not there yet. So I don't think we need to rush it. It'll happen if we need to. Again, I don't think CO2 is the demon. There's lots of more practical alternatives we can, we can, we can affect to, uh, to make the world a better place. Thanks, Scott. Uh, over to you now, Jennifer Purdy. Hey, so, um, oh, pardon me. I'm just going to look at the question again. Right. Um, so we want to accelerate the transition. I, I disagree with Scott. I, we do need subsidies. And the subsidies that we have right now are insufficient. Uh, I bought my used leaf in 2019, and uh, there was no access to a subsidy from the federal government. And at the time, there was no subsidy uh, available for you know for a used car, at, even at the provincial government or elsewhere. Uh, so, and the other thing too is my understanding is that the subsidies only apply for people buying new EVs. They are incredibly expensive, uh, which is why I bought used. And uh, so the subsidies are an important part of just of encouraging people. The other thing too, of course, is the Green Party is on is on track for we want to ban the sale of internal combustion engine uh, vehicles pass for passengers uh, by 2030. Um, the other thing too is, is that uh, to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles, um, as OC Transpo requires more buses, if the buses, if they haven't completely uh, converted their, uh, like uh, all of their buses, or pardon me, uh, their fleet to being electric only, then of course the federal government, I would be uh, encouraging the, the federal government to step in. And uh, just uh, somewhat related, because we are basically talking about transportation, the Green Party also wants to create a national seconds. cycling and walking infrastructure fund to help zero emissions active transportation. But again, we, we, we need to be subsidizing this because EVs are still so expensive. They are beyond the reach for most people. Thanks very much, uh, Jennifer. Uh, up next is Melissa Conrad. Thank you so much. So I think that um, we definitely have to invest in more charging stations because to encourage people to get around, we need to give them the capacity to get around. And um, an NDP government is looking to increase the subsidies to $15,000 per family for zero emission vehicles um, because we know that for a lot of families, $5,000 is simply not enough. Um, so that should help encourage people um, because they also have to put charging stations in their homes. It's not just the vehicle and we understand that that's expensive. So I think that um, the other thing that we really need to look at is um, hydrogen uh, fuel cells for freight, for marine, for aeronautics, because you know the byproduct of hydrogen fuel cells is water, which makes it clean in the end. And it may not be that transports and trains can run on electricity. So we are going to have to look at alternative clean energy for that as well. So we are going to be investing in that research and that technology to ensure that all of our vehicles, commercial and personal, can get to zero emissions in time uh, for the 2035 uh, banning of um, motor vehicles. So we need to invest in all of that, which will also create great jobs in Canada because the technology is not yet there and we need to invest in it, Canadian made Thanks, and guys. Canadian implemented um, so that we can have uh, all of our vehicles at zero emissions by 2035. Thanks, Melissa. So now we're moving on to another section. And just as a reminder to the, to, to the crowd tonight, uh, please submit questions in the Q&A spot. We're going to be drawing from those questions uh, later on this evening. Uh, but for now, we're gonna move on to uh, questions on climate change and the renewable energy transition. So here's the question. In August, 2021, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC issued a stark report on the state of global climate change. The report calls for unprecedented action to avoid what they call climate catastrophe. This includes a call for a 45% emissions cut by 2030 and full net zero emissions by 2050. Cities, especially larger cities uh, in developed countries like Ottawa are critical to global success in the fight against climate change. And while emissions cuts are essential, we also know that the transition to a green economy can bring a host of benefits and opportunities. As MP, what are some of the key areas of opportunity and action on climate for Ottawa to join the ranks of outstanding climate-friendly capital cities? What would you do as MP to support some of those initiatives and some of those uh, opportunities? Uh, I know this one's a big one, so I'm just gonna put it in the chat here and uh, hand it over to uh, Jennifer Purdy whenever you're ready. Okay, so let's see. 
key areas of opportunity and action on climate. Okay, so the big one, which of course uh, resonates for people in Canada Carleton is LRT expansion to Canada Stittsville. That's uh, one uh, big thing that can get uh, vehicles off the road, number one. Uh, number two, uh, expanding on bandwidth. Uh, internet is an issue that's come up in our, our debates previously. We've all seen, um, pardon me, many people across Ottawa, uh, even in the urban areas have found that their internet has been lacking, has also been very expensive, uh, especially if there's like a, a three or four people on internet trying to do schooling from home. But people being able to work from home and not having to commute, you, you lessen your carbon footprint, you're not in a vehicle, and it also increases your quality of life. Mm, let's see. Uh, and then uh, otherwise also uh, building, right? We, we are in a, uh, a lack of housing crisis right now as well. And it's important to address that. But how we build these uh, new, uh, new housing is really important. If we can build uh, net zero housing, uh, make it affordable and uh, make it accessible as well, then that will also help to make us uh, one, you know, a, a city that could be an example to much of the rest of the world. The other thing too that the Green Party is looking at is ideally having a community where you're, you know, where you are living Ten is seconds. very close to where you work, very close to your, you know, the grocery store, and uh, so that a person can have sustainable living, increased quality of life, and better air quality. And after this summer, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, up next is Melissa. Melissa, please go ahead. Thank you so much. There is a lot of things we can do in Ottawa. Um, this is where the federal government lives. This is where we run. This is where our home is. And the NDP really wants to start by leading by example and focusing on federal buildings and federal fleets and making them zero emissions as soon as possible. Because if a government doesn't lead by example, how can you expect people to invest their own money in something if the government doesn't believe in it? So that's something that we're really proud of. Um, LRT, getting that out to Canada and beyond, out to Stittsville, out to CARP, hopefully eventually, so that people don't have to drive into the city when they choose to live in the country. We are all one big city expanding out. We're also looking to expand um, a rail line over to Quebec um, that's being talked about and why not? Yes, it's cross province. Yes, it's new, but we have so many people that live over there and have to drive into the city because they can't get here on zero emissions. They have to take the bus if they want to cross the bridge, if they don't drive. Um, so that's something uh, since the federal government is very spread out that we're looking to invest in with the province and with the cities as well. There are so many things we can do as a government that we have control of. Um, right away that will really put Ottawa at the forefront of capitals and uh, something that um, Ottawa residents and Canada Carleton residents can be extremely proud of. Thanks, Melissa. Now over to you, Jenna. Thank you. Um, so I recall through my work as a uh, city councillor when we were going through our climate plan at council and at committee, that uh, our largest uh, carbon emitter, if you will, was through our physical infrastructure, through our buildings. Um, and that's true of, of course, our, our downtown core, our city buildings, our federal buildings, and then of course uh, trickles down to us as individuals and where we live. Um, so in that regard, uh, retrofit, making those buildings as carbon neutral as possible is uh, the first really necessary step. And as a liberal government, a reelected liberal government, we will continue uh, to help Canadians improve the energy efficiency of our homes and reduce their energy bills by providing grants of up to $5,000 for home retrofits and interest-free loans of up to $4,000, excuse me, $40,000 for deep retrofits. So that's our physical infrastructure, lots we could be doing there, investing in solar, et cetera. But as well, of course, we know beyond that, it's how we move around the city. And uh, clean electric transportation is the way to go. A re-elected Liberal government is committed to investing in stage three LRT to Canada to connect us to the rest of Ottawa, as well as we announced a $10 million pilot of AV shuttles to connect the tech park. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Now uh, over to you, Scott.
First off, I'd like you to thank you to thank you for inviting me to this debate. I wasn't invited to the one in 2019. It's a bit like going into a lion's den, but not too bad because I'm right. So, but if you'd heard me in 2019, one of the things I was banging on about uh, is is when everyone is saying we need billions to have the LRT, I was saying what we need to do is reduce the need for people to travel in the first place. So the, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Let's hit the number one first, reduce and make the transition to telework. Well, I'll be damned if we didn't do it. It took a global pandemic and I'm, I'm sorry for triggering that, but may, might've been my fault. But we, we've made 10 years of progress in telecommuting in, in six or nine months. It's a huge improvement. It's the single biggest thing we could have done for emissions. And it's the single biggest thing we do for improving people's lives. We're not done yet, but we've shown we can make a, that that had had a tremendous impact. Beyond that, ensuring be, be, beyond ensuring that everybody can either work, if not at home, then close to home. And we can do that with, with fiber optics. Uh, ensure that everyone in the riding and everyone in the province has access to high speed internet. And this will be, it's a lot cheaper to run a fiber optic cable than it is to do the truck roll. You only have to do the truck roll once and the cable's there forever. Here's my dog going crazy again. Further than that, I would endow a nuclear research uh, chairs if possible at Ten universities seconds. in Ottawa, because if we're going to decarbonize the world, nuclear energy is the only practical way that we can do that. Canada used to be a leader and we pissed away our leadership over the past 20 years. Uh, All right, thank you very much, Scott. So the next uh, category of questions, we're going back to a health focus. Uh, and quite soon we're gonna be turning to the audience for, uh, for questions from the audience. So uh, let's, let's end the uh, planned questions here and then dive into audience questions after this one. Here's the question. Air pollution is linked to many health problems, including lung disease, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and pregnancy-related complications. In Health Canada's uh, Health Impacts of Air Pollution report from 2021, they estimate that air pollution from human sources contributes to 3,000 premature deaths per year in Canada, including 500 deaths in Ottawa, according to the Ontario Medical Association. These deaths are avoidable. If elected, what will you do to ensure that air pollution standards are improved? And with that, I'll hand it back over to Scott to, uh, to answer this one. Unmute. Okay, did you say 3,000 per year and 500 in Ottawa? First, that those numbers can't be right unless we're, I mean, this is not Sudbury. We don't have an inco, in, uh, uh, Inco here. Uh, but in terms of, I already addressed air pollution. So air pollution, actual air pollution, not CO2 is one of the, is one of the effects that we need to uh, address and we have addressed and will continue to, to address. Smog, sulfur dioxide, uh, the nitro related nitrous oxides are things we can, we need to, particularly in cities, we need to address so we can get that with the emission controls. And without a lot of cost, it takes, uh, you, these, these come into place over the years, catalytic converters have made a difference. They're, they were, they were, people complained about it in the 70s, but it's all perfectly accepted now. Uh, internal combustion engines, as much as people may hate them, are tremendously, tremendously more fuel efficient than anything we've had in the past. And along with the fuel efficiency, they, they uh, generate a fraction of the, of the emissions uh, that, that cars used to do. So I think we've gone a long way there, eliminating coal for electricity generation if we can, because if we can't put scrubbers on, and I don't know the details, they, you know, the coal industry says it can be made clean and perhaps it can, we need to do that because particulates in the air are actual pollution. Uh, sulfur dioxide is actual pollution, smog is actual pollution. And these are things we need to focus on and not the boogeyman of CO2. Thank you, Scott. Up next, Jenna Sutz. Finding my unmute button, thank you. Um, so when I think about obviously the impact of pollution on our health, it's a serious issue that we need to get serious about. And uh, the Liberal government has approached this in one impactful way. And I believe that is by putting a price on pollution. Uh, pollution always has a cost and that's why we've made, it sh made sure that it's no longer free to pollute anywhere in Canada. You know, despite object, object, objections, excuse me, from the Conservatives, uh, every step of the way as we try to implement this, our price on pollution is internationally recognized as a model system. 
Um, together, we've proved to the world that what people really want is good climate policy, not political obstruction. And we know that a strong price on pollution can have strong impact on reducing our emissions and improving our health outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Now over to Melissa. Thank you so much. I think there's a lot of things we can do. And, you know, I circle back to some of the things I've already mentioned. Um, re, you know, planting trees, ensuring our forests are full of trees to help carbon dioxide in the air. Um, getting rid of the pipeline. I know that both the Liberals and the Conservatives are very keen on keeping the pipeline and investing in that. The NDP is not interested in that. We need to invest that, those billions and billions of dollars that um, the current government is investing in the pipeline into clean technology. We need to, in, we need to research clean technology for industry, for farming. We need to get it out there and available to Canadians, made by Canadians for our climate. Because as we've seen with the LRT project, if it's not made for our climate, it's not going to function very well. So we need to focus on Canadian made, zero emission vehicles, the $15,000 subsidy for families, um, having the uh, Canadian Environmental Bill of Rights, which is going to focus on land, air and water cleaning and keeping clean. And, it, and that will enable us to enforce it. Making the largest polluters pay as well is going to help, but it is not the end answer because it doesn't get us anywhere other than them paying more money and being able to continue to pollute, exactly. which is what both the liberal and conservative governments are focusing on. So we need to do better for Canadians. Thank you, Melissa. Now over to Jennifer. Yeah, I agree to some extent with the NDP candidate because it's one thing about improving the air pollution standards. Uh, that's simply because it uh, becomes a cost of doing business uh, for the businesses that are polluting. And uh, I'm aware of the air quality testing that has been done uh, over the last couple of years here in Ottawa. And uh, it, it's, you know, like even construction, uh, you will find air quality is terrible, but near construction, uh, it apparently was worse at times this summer in CARP than it was in downtown Ottawa. And in uh, Kachemovic, it was worse uh, inside the house as well as outside the house uh, compared to downtown Ottawa. So it's, it's one thing to have standards and, uh, you know, but the enforcement needs to be increased. And that's where the federal government and the Green Party, of course, we would be all about enforcing it. But let's, uh, let's take a crack at air pollution itself. We have to cancel the oil and gas subsidies. We have to cancel the TMX pipeline, which is taking us to three to four degrees. The other parties don't seem to understand this because they are still saying, well, that's just how we're gonna pay for climate change by having a pipeline. It, the science, it, it doesn't work. And science will not, uh, is, is not, is not just not gonna follow propaganda. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it just does not work out, right? So we need to do that. We need to improve the electric grid and basically transition off of fossil fuels and to sustainable energy sources uh, so that we, because Fantastic. that will impact air pollution. So you can have, the, you can improve the standards, you can increase the fines, but at the end of the day, we have to attack in an evidence-based matter, the, the source of the issue. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. So now we're moving on to audience questions and I've got one here from anonymous attendee. <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional or not or if that's just the name that automatically was generated. In any case, it's short and sweet. And, uh, and so I'll just read it, we'll post it and then we'll ask uh, Scott to uh, start off uh, answering this one. Um, if you could choose one single environmental initiative or project to deliver for Canada Carleton over the next four years, what would that be? Scott, please go ahead. One single thing I think I'd like to see, we don't get talked about a lot, is waste to energy. So right now we have out here in, in CARP, we get to watch Mount CARP get bigger every day. It's a landfill right by the 417. We have too much garbage. Uh, we, we can try to reduce the amount of garbage, but we have a lot of garbage to deal with. So a modern waste to energy plant would take that garbage and turn it into electricity. There, uh, there's examples all over Europe. You can go check out the videos. These, these things can snug into neighborhoods. They're clean, they're efficient, and they reduce the amount of, of stuff you have to throw in a landfill. That would be, I think that would be a big impact right here of both garbage and energy. I think it's set a good example. And, but we've also got to stop importing garbage from other places. All right, 
Thanks, Scott. Uh, now back to you, Jenna Sets. Terrific. This is a great question. It really makes me think. Um, and, you know, I, I think what I would love to tackle if given the opportunity is food waste. We are very fortunate in Canada Carleton to have some amazing growers and farmers, um, but we, we waste too much. And uh, I would love if we could move forward with an initiative here locally and, and let's scale it federally that would uh, eliminate that waste, help build a, a circular food economy, if you will, here in our community where no food is wasted from farm to table. Uh, it's ambitious, but I think there's opportunities and there's also a need. Um, I know through my work with the Canada Food Cupboard that 250 families are coming for food assistance every month, um, yet there's others that are wasting. Um, so, I know there's lots of things we could tackle, but this one resonates. Everyone deserves access to fresh, healthy food. And uh, we are a very fortunate community and a very fortunate country, and we can tackle this issue. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Okay, now back to Melissa. If you could choose one single environmental initiative or project to deliver on for Canada Carleton during the next four years, what would that be? Thank you so much. That's, it's a great question. Um, I think what I'm hearing a lot about um, when I'm out in more rural areas of Canada Carleton is, you know, farmers looking for initiatives, um, farmers and growers of all kinds, we have a vineyard as well, looking for initiatives to lessen their impact on the environment. And so helping them to find uh, cost effective ways to transition to less emissions so that they can grow more crops, better crops be more self-sustainable um, and have better capacity in extreme weather, especially when we don't get a lot of water, um, would be advantageous for the farm to table, as well as would be more advantageous um, to our food banks to be able to have the food available and for people to be able to shop local at the markets and right at the farms. There's a lot of farms that will deliver right to your door um, when it's local here in Canada. And I think that those are fantastic initiatives that we need to support and help as much as we can um, at the federal level, working with the provinces and the farmers. Thanks very much, Melissa. Now over to Jennifer Purdy. Yeah, and I too, uh, this, is a, this is a question that really gets you thinking because of the time limit, it's a short time limit of four years and also uh, with it being specific to Canada Carleton and I've been thinking, I'm just trying to figure out what is the ba biggest bang for the buck from a climate change perspective and from an environmental perspective. And to me, I'm still, if there was still a requirement and I believe there is because people are having to head back into work uh, not everyone can work from home I'm still thinking that the LRT, I believe, would deliver a, the biggest bang for the buck from a carbon footprint perspective. Um, and it would be within, I, to me, that should be doable within four years, as long as we get the contracting that process and that sort of thing down. Obviously, the federal government would not be involved in the contracting process, but it would be, of course, involved in providing the money uh, so that the funding can be obtained sooner rather than later. So with the constraints as posed in that question, uh, to me, the, the answer, and I know it won't affect everyone directly, but from an air quality perspective, uh, LRT to Canada Stittsville. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Okay, we've got another uh, question from the audience. This one's actually a, a two-parter, uh, just there, I'm, I'm seeing it more than one place. So I'll, I'll actually post both questions for your, your information. I'll read them both, but they're around a common theme, which is uh, rail. So the first question, uh, and and you know we haven't vetted some of these claims, so so uh, you know take them take them as they are. Given that half the population of Canada live within the Quebec Windsor corridor, it is crucial to ensure transportation within this corridor is emissions free or close to zero. A high frequency rail strategy has been announced, yet the travel times will only bring us back to 1970s and 80s travel times. High speed rail will get people uh, out of cars and planes and onto trains. Will you advocate for high speed rail? So that's the first question. The second similar question is, I was wondering if each of the candidates are in favor of truly high speed rail, for example, 300 miles or kilometers an hour and building it from Windsor to Quebec City. 
in the future. I believe this would really help uh, reduce pollution and congestion in this part of the country. So I'll post those in a second, but both, both on the theme of high-speed rail. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, Melissa to answer this one from the public. Um, ad admittedly, I'm not very familiar with high-speed rail, um, but uh, I have heard in European countries where they do have it, it works very well and uh, doesn't have a lot of um, negative impacts. So, I mean, I am all for any clean energy rail that will get people off the roads. Um, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with whether or not it can be hydrogen powered, and I'm not sure if it's electric. I'm, I'm thinking that it's probably electric, but like I said, I'm not sure, but I am, I'm in favor of anything um, that is safe, um, that will get people off the roads in dense areas. And so a rail system between Windsor and Quebec um, that will be, um, have less impact on the environment and get people around is definitely something that I would be in support of uh, from the federal government's perspective, as much as the federal government would get involved with something like that. Obviously with environmental assessments and impact uh, done, so that we know um, all the issues that could arise uh, with our different climate, um, because I'm not sure how uh, effective high-speed rail is in very cold and very hot weather, but I'd have to look into that. But I'm definitely for anything that gets Thanks, cars Jennifer. off the road. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, now over to you, uh, Jennifer Purdy. Okay, thank you. So. Um, yeah, I'm definitely a fan of high speed rail. Uh, just taking for as people start to go back to work, they're no longer working from home. People are traveling again, and high speed rail would get uh, there would be uh, fewer planes going from Ottawa to Toronto, Toronto to Montreal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I've always seen as taking the train as being very advantageous because uh, unlike in the plane, I have access to Wi-Fi. I'm able to get work done. Uh, it's very comfortable, uh, but yes, a time is uh, time is a constraint for many people. So yes, I'm a fan, a fan of high-speed rail. It is actually it's in the green platform because of course we're an evidence-based party, and it, it makes sense because uh, you know uh, by having that network between major cities in this corridor. We can uh, get people out of cars, we can get them out of planes, uh, we can be uh, reducing our footprint, but also giving people a bit, a bit of time back where they can relax, get work done, but also uh, be knowledgeable and, comfort and comforted in their knowledge that they are reducing their footprint as well. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, now over to you, Scott Miller. I, I, being an engineer, I love trains. I always like trains. But I don't know about the economic justification in those corridors. I've seen, seen the plans, they talked about it. I did notice the sleight of hand a couple of years ago when they, the talk went from high speed rail to high frequency rail. And I think I'm sure that had to do with infrastructure because our tracks were not made for high speed rail. It would be a gigantic cost, uh, depending on the government to put it in place, it'd more or less be more likely be SNC Laval and that did the work and it probably wouldn't work very well. But if it could work, if the economic justification was there, I think it's a really good idea. Uh, Europeans have extensive electric intercity rail networks. Again, I, I don't know how much travel there is from Windsor to Toronto, or certainly Windsor to Toronto, maybe. I don't know. You know, If you had 10 stations along the rail, I don't know how high speed it is. So I'm a, a supporter in general. Just with the caveat that programs like that tend to turn into gigantic boondoggles. We've got a high-speed rail uh, scenario in California right now that's just terrible. Billions and billions of dollars have disappeared. We might want to wait for Elon Musk to come along once he gets his uh, what's it called the Hyperloop ready. Then uh, that we might be in a position where he could do that for us. But in general, it's a, it's certainly worth exploring. Thanks, Scott. Now over to you, Jenna Sutz. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I believe this is a really exciting opportunity, and frankly, it's our evolution. Uh, if we think about uh, taxi versus Uber, we know we're probably more likely to get an Uber. We know times are changing with gas-powered cars versus electric, and by 2030, we hope to be all in electric. Um, so when it comes to a train versus uh, high speeds, a clean high speed uh, option, it just makes sense. Um, this is how we evolve as society. 
Uh, it's an alternative that gets cars off the road. It gets people where they need to be faster uh, with less impact environmentally. Uh, and I would suggest it will also result in less planes. There's lots of business travel, lots of personal travel uh, throughout this Ontario corridor between Windsor, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec. Uh, and this is an opportunity to, uh, to do so in a clean, environmentally friendly way. So I'm excited. I think this is an opportunity that we need to seize as a country. Uh, obviously with caution, um, but I do think uh, there's a lot of potential here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenna. So we're going to go to one more question from the public, and then we'll move to closing statements. Uh, and, and we should be able to wrap up around quarter after, as, as we said at the front end. So this is this is another question from the public, and fair warning to Jenna, you'll, you'll, you're going to be asked to, to answer this, and I will, of course, post it right after saying it. How would you support Indigenous climate leadership, and what is your vision for an equitable green slash sustainable recovery? So post that, and over to you, Jenna Sutz. So I'm just going to let myself read it one more time here before I... Indigenous climate leadership, and what is your vision for an equitable green sustainable? Okay, um, so obviously this is a, a big topic, um, but all that to say, uh, the Liberal government has uh, supported the United, ne United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and passed an act earlier this year to ensure that the principles are implemented. Uh, this requires uh, our government to work in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples and to prepare an action plan to address key things such as in, in, excuse me, injustices and to identify uh, measures that best align with our laws. Um, this includes uh, all aspects of a green and a sustainable recovery and future. Um, obviously I support this work. It's important work that needs to be done uh, in our journey of reconciliation. And I know that a re-elected Liberal government is committed to a whole of government approach, uh, including this in every uh, cabinet minister's, minister's mandate letter and making sure that uh, we walk this path, path together with the Indigenous people. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenna. Uh, over to you, Scott Miller. I reject the notion that there is such a thing as Indigenous climate leadership. I see no evidence that Indigenous people have any special relationship with the land, as you might you might say. And climate leadership can come from anybody. And if somebody comes from Bangladesh or Berlin, they're just as likely to have good ideas on, on climate stewardship as, as an indigenous, indigenous person. So I reject that from the beginning. Uh, a sustainable recovery, equitable is a word that can mean anything you want, but a sustainable recovery, sustainable growth forward means something economically sustainable as well. So if we do energy upgrades, they should pay for themselves in tangible benefits. We should save energy, not just be chasing after, again, the CO2 boogeyman, but something they should pay for themselves with reduced energy use. If they don't pay for themselves, it's not worth doing. We can put that money somewhere else. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, up next is uh, Jennifer Purdy. Hey, so um, I, as I said before, I am a leader, but to be a good leader, you also have to be a good follower and you have to be able to work with people. So I would throw my support behind and with Indigenous climate leadership. And that may be coming from First Nations, Métis and Inuit, uh, Inuit pardon me. Um, and in terms of leadership, we are actually, we've been seeing a lot of leadership from, from Indigenous across the country, including right now in Ferry Creek, right? Um, and so I'd be supporting them as an MP and, uh, I'd, be so, uh, and I'd be working with them uh, because for example, TMX, every other big, the large parties are all still behind Trans Mountain Extension Pipeline. It's ridiculous. It takes us to three to four degrees of warming. It's also, it's violating the rights of First Nations. They're in opposition to this pipeline. I realize there may be some groups who are not, but they, uh, 
many Indigenous, most Indigenous have a much closer link to the land than at least I do as an individual. I, it's just not as deep set. There seems to be a, a significant difference and it needs to be respected. Um, and in terms of my vision for equitable, green, sustainable recovery, we're all in this together. But if we don't take care of people, with, you know, like an Indigenous or not, if we don't take care of people, we will not succeed. So Insane. my vision is, we're thank you, is we're taking, we're, we're taking the steps we need to address climate change uh, aggressively because we've waited so long, we've just wasted six years, but then we also make sure we take care of everyone along for the ride. So we. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, over to Melissa, and then we're going to move to closing statements from all the candidates. Go ahead, Melissa. Thank you so much. So I would first like to recognize that um, our Indigenous settlers were here before we were. Um, this is the unceded territory of the Algonquin National Way. So we need to partner with them. I, I firmly believe that reconciliation and climate um, initiatives really go hand in hand because part of reconciliation is reconciling with the land because we are ruining this land. We are ruining this planet. And the NDP has made it very clear that the indigenous leaders, um, Inuit, Métis, um, they're all going to have a seat at the table. They are equal partners in climate action and they have great ideas that are very sustainable. They are also already proven, a lot of them. Um, we need to clean our waters. We need to get them clean drinking water. The fact that these people don't have clean drinking water um, in a lot of their areas is really disgraceful and shameful. So we're talking about sustainable climate action. We need to start with getting every single Canadian clean drinking water and not just pallets of bottled water to drink like actual drinking water out of their faucets they can shower and bathe in because a lot of them don't have that right now. And um, a lot of the other initiatives that the NDP has sorry. on their platform will be sustainable and it will really help renew the earth and bring it back to what it should be. Thank you very much, Melissa. All right, now we're moving to closing statements from each of the candidates. And so what we're going to do is give each candidate one and a half minutes each and we're gonna go in a reverse order from our introduction uh, order. So that means we'll start with Scott, move to Jenna, then Melissa, then Jennifer. Uh, so closing statements, Scott, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just restate that I, I'm a fan of the planet, but I, I want actual, uh, reasonable, practical measures to improve the planet, not empty headed virtue signaling. So I, I look back at in Ottawa, we found out, I, I was tremendously betrayed. It was just a couple of years ago, we found out that recycling had been just mixed into the landfill and they weren't telling us. I'd been, I look ahead of, I have a neighbor who's never recycled a thing in his life. He just threw everything in the garbage. And here I'm separating out envelopes, the, the windows from envelopes to put them into plastic and put the paper where they go. Turns out he had the right idea all along because all they were doing, there was no market for the plastics. So they just mixed it in with the regular garbage stream. We try to recycle plastics and they ship it. We found their shipping containers to the Philippines. We found their shipping garbage to, to China. All of which is just, it is specifically virtue signaling. It doesn't help the world at all, but it makes people feel a little bit better and it costs a lot of money. So empty gestures like that are, is not the way forward. We need to have practical, reasonable things to do. Uh, I looked at, uh, watched recently Michael Moore's Planet of the Humans. It was really eye-opening. Uh, to see the these were probably well-intentioned things to to make the world a better place, but that we've been subverted at every turn. A biomass plant I used I used to think was was burning algae. It's not. It's burning whole trees. That's not the way forward. So we need reasonable, practical measures to make the world a better place. Thank you, Scott. Now over to Genesis. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have a decision to make and we cannot move backwards. The decisions that we make now uh, as we work to get out of this pandemic are critical to our future and that of our children and our grandchildren. I wholeheartedly believe that the party that has led us through these last difficult 18 months is the best party to lead us through the next 18 months and beyond. We need a Liberal government re-elected to continue the hard work of finishing the fight against COVID and addressing our climate crisis. We have the strongest climate plan of any party. 
that will lower emissions and grow a clean economy. The Liberal Climate Plan is building and will continue to build a green recovery to create jobs and grow the middle class while ensuring a cleaner future for our children and grandchildren. Climate change is the greatest long-term threat of our time, but it is also our greatest economic opportunity. And Canada has the skilled workforce, the innovative spirit and the natural resources at our fingertips to succeed. We have done more to fight climate change and protect our environment than any government in Canadian history. We have a choice to make and I'm Ten asking seconds. you to choose Liberal. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenna. Uh, up next is Melissa. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. So I'm really proud of the NDP's bold climate targets and their courage to take immediate action, starting with federal, federal buildings and federal fleets, because we understand that families can't retrofit their homes coming out of this pandemic when many of them are barely getting by and or some even going into debt month over month. So the Liberals offer of $5,000 to retrofit your home simply won't be taken up. We think that $15,000 per family on zero emission vehicles is very enticing for families looking for new vehicles that will get them around. Um, the Canadian Environmental Bill of Rights will protect our land, air, and water, get it clean, and keep it that way. It will be enforceable. Um, Indigenous reconciliation is something that we have to consider moving forward. Every Canadian deserves a full and safe education in their homes, as well as drinkable water running through their homes. They need the infrastructure to be sustainable in the communities so that they can thrive independently. Um, we need to look at, you know, if the Liberal government wanted to bring us out of this pandemic, they wouldn't have called this election jeopardizing many and bringing them out of their homes, having us canvassing, sitting here today. So the choice is clear that Canadians are ready for better. This Liberal government is... Thanks very much, Melissa. Now over to Dr. Jennifer Purdy for the final closing statements, and then I'll wrap things up. Okay, thank you. So first off, thank you to everyone for taking the time to tune in this evening. We need to take a team-based, all-hands-on-deck approach to moving forward in the next couple of years. We can't afford to have people running Parliament who refuse to work with other parties on our code red, which is climate change. I am a team player, and unlike the other candidates here tonight, I cannot be benched or even fired by my party for speaking my mind or for voting the way my constituents tell me to vote. This freedom and ethical obligation to do the right thing for constituents and to listen to you to work with MPs regardless of their party. This is the only way we will get to where we need to in our fight against climate change and protecting the environment. I will work for you, our future, and no one else. I'm an evidence-based doctor and the Green Party is an evidence-based party. So if elected, I will of course work towards social programs, but we must also start taking concrete action on climate change, including canceling the TMX pipeline and oil and gas subsidies immediately. We can have a better, brighter future, but we need to work on this together, regardless of party lines. Give me the chance to work hard, to work hard with others, to make it right for all of us. Vote for me, Jen Purdy. All right, thank you all very much for taking the time this evening. Uh, we know that campaigns are busy times and really appreciate you know taking an hour and, and a bit to to, to join us and to offer your diverse views. I uh, really appreciate the, the diversity of perspectives and the different angles that you're coming at. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, really appreciate everyone who attended and submitted questions for tonight's debate. So thank you to the candidates. Thank you to all who attended. Uh, as, uh, as promised, we will be posting this on YouTube. Uh, it's streaming on Facebook Live. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, and don't forget to vote. I just posted in the chat uh, some information on voting. You can look up your postal code, find out when to vote, where to vote. September 20th is election day. Thank you all. And I'll just ask that uh, Sarah and Eric stay after the call for a quick debrief. Uh, but I also just want to take this opportunity to thank Sarah and uh, MD Moms for Healthy Recovery for collaborating on this initiative and uh, joining us. Thanks. I've been Rob Barnes with the College of Ottawa. Have a great night. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Good night.
Thank you. Thank you.